Good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday to you. Thanks for being with us. What an interesting time we are in in the life of the church. We did not begin our live stream until the pandemic forced our hand. Unlike many large churches that were already doing so, uh, we don't have a lot of experience with managing in-person gatherings and online gatherings simultaneously. As our in-person gathering steadily grows, we want our online community to know that you matter and that we care for you deeply and that our stream is not going away. What I'd like to do now is highlight some ways that you can reach out to us and let us know how we can best serve you. First, in a couple moments, you are going to have an opportunity to chat with an online host. These are individuals here at the church that are looking for opportunities to engage and connect with you and an opportunity for you to get to know us a little bit better. And at the bottom of your screen, there's a button that you can press for live prayer. And our online hosts would love nothing more than to pray with you right now. During the middle of the week, if a prayer request should come about, you can reach out to our prayer coordinators, uh, Jack and Tina Glenn, and that would give them the opportunity to then take that prayer request and pass it on to some individuals in our church who would like nothing more to be praying for you as well. And lastly, you can always reach out to our staff members. We would love to connect with you, to speak with you, and even take a prayer request that you have and put it on our prayer board downstairs so that anybody in an in-person gathering could take that request home and stand underneath that burden with you. We care for you deeply. We are so glad that you are here, wherever in the world you may be, and for whatever reason you can't be with us today. We love you, and we care for you, and we hope you have a blessed Sunday. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. I invite you to stand with us as we begin our time together by lifting up our voices before the Lord. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. As broken hearts declare his praise, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. So open up the gates. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. 
and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing it together, Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness when darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne let's sing it together in Christ alone Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong 
and the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Oh, Father, what a wonderful thought to think that because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we can stand before the throne faultless. And Father, we gather here today on that truth that before you, covered in your righteousness, we are faultless. And we praise you for that. And we do pray this in your name. Amen. And you may be seated. Good morning once again and welcome. We are so glad that you were here with you. Welcome to those that are watching online. We are so glad you've taken some time out of your day to be with us this morning. Just a couple announcements to be to keep in front of you. Uh, first of all is our summer, summer discipleship series is beginning very soon. And uh, it is based on a book written by Sinclair Ferguson on the Holy Spirit. All of our small groups will be doing it. And if you would like to participate in that, uh, what you need to do is go to our website, follow the instructions to sign up in one of those groups. Now, if that thought right there is causing you to break out into a sweat, don't worry about it. Just call the office. And we will make sure that you get in assigned to one of these groups because we would like you to participate uh, in that as well. And then secondly, uh, if you were here last week, you said Jeremy Windler was preaching, and uh, we found out that he and Kayla are going to be leaving us, heading to the mission field. This was always their plan. It's just going a little, a little bit ahead of of time. And uh, so this week, I had an opportunity to sit down with Jeremy and Kayla um, and talk about what's next for them. And we recorded that conversation in our podcast, Grounding Our Faith. And I just encourage you to go and listen to it. I, I gave them an opportunity to share what's coming next for them as they look to continue raising funds. And then what does it look like for them to land in Paraguay? Uh, what it's going to look like for them there? And then I asked them, because both of them grew up in the mission field, I said, what did it, what did it mean for you to grow up in the mission field? And kind of what your parents' faith lived out before you, what kind of role did that play into you guys making the decision that you wanted to be missionaries yourself? And then the last question I asked him, which was my favorite, is, is it safe? When I was working in Haiti, I always had moms and dads asking me as they gave me their children to take to Haiti for a short-term trip, is it safe? And I wanted to ask them, as they are taking their very young family away from Western culture into a place, is it safe? Can you take your young kids there? And really what it means to, to, to balance risk and wisdom and the gospel. And it was a great conversation. I highly recommend you take the time, go download Grounding Our Faith. Uh, you can get it anywhere you get your podcasts. And, uh, and I think you'll be encouraged by that conversation. I know I certainly was. Um, and if you've been with us over the past several months, each month we're taking some time to hear from one of our missionaries to allow them to participate in our service by reading scripture for us as well. And uh, this morning we have Gordy and Bear Grover who are serving in the Rubulga Dominican. And we're going to hear a little update on them, and then they're going to be reading, uh, Gordy's going to be reading the scripture for us. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to go to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, starting in verse 32, and uh, that's going to be the passage that they will be reading. But first, we're going to hear an update on what God's been doing in their life recently and how we can be praying for them. So, Gordy and Bear Grover. Hi. For folks that don't know who we are, I'm Gordy. This is Bear. And we have been missionaries with you folks in Spofford for a long time. Um, the missions team asked us to give up. A brief update, so we thought we'd do that for you. We just sold our home here in Wisconsin. Um, we'll be looking for a place somewhere in central Florida that we can rent out so that we can afford an apartment in Santo Domingo. Uh, we moved to Florida the first week of August. Lord willing, we'll be in Santo Domingo by the end of August. And uh, if you would be kind enough to pray with us for our immigration lawyer. Uh, we're working with someone from the Dominican Republic. Uh, there's tons of paperwork that we need to complete, and we still don't even know what all that paperwork entails. Um, the government there has been shut down off and on, and they seem to be working on a skeleton cruise. So if you would pray for that paperwork to come through so that we can complete it and get it returned so that we can become... Dominican Republic residents, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for your patience 
and prayers and support during this long transition we've been involved in. We're excited to be finally moving forward. So thanks for your prayers. Thanks for your support. God bless. Good morning. I'll be reading from the ESV, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 40. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you so much for Gordy and, and Bear. And there are many faithful years of service all over this world for you. And I thank you, Father, that we have an opportunity to partner with them on this latest adventure to the Dominican Republic. And specifically, Father, that we are asking that you would just go before them and paving a way that they'd be able to get there in time. We rest in the truth and the fact that you are God of the paperwork. And I pray that for all of the, the paperwork that they have to fill out, Father, that you would make it available to them, that they'd be able to get it, fill it out, and get it back to the Dominican in a timely manner. Father, that you would just make sure that all of those details are taken care of. You are sovereign over all these things. Help us to trust you and to believe, Father, that the work that you have planned for Gordy and for Bear there will be carried out in the exact time frame in which you've called them to do it. And Father, we're so excited for the, for the time of ministry that's taking place here, Father, for the opportunities that those who are gathered here and those that are watching online to, to minister to those that are around them, whether it's in school or at work or at home, Father, opportunities abound. And I pray that by faith, Father, that we would seek onto each and every one of them, grasping them, taking advantage of the opportunities that you have given us. And Father, we're excited about this building and as we're getting closer and closer to the time where we're going to be able to occupy it and looking forward to all the ministry opportunities that will be there, help us to trust you in that as well. Father, would you remind us to walk by faith, even in exciting seasons, and remind us what it is to walk by faith, even in despair and in fear. Father, help us to trust you in all of these things. And for Pastor Lou, as he comes in a few moments, Father, give him courage and boldness to declare your word that we would be transformed here today. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we're going to continue time of singing together. Seated above Throned in the Father's love Destined to die Poured out for all mankind God's only Son Perfect and spotless one he never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority. All authority.
every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what patience would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the violence the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more They are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Father, we do thank you that your mercy is so great. We, none of us would be able to stand here if it were not for that, for our sins are so great. But we know that you offer us forgiveness through your beloved Son, and we just relish in that now and seek to serve you as best we can. And you would open our eyes to your word this morning, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and if you could be... Turning back to our passage this morning in Hebrews chapter 11, as we finish up this great Hall of Faith chapter, we all know there are many effective ways to present teachings from Scripture. Sometimes preachers wish to give a lesson on a certain subject or topic, and so they a topic that they believe the people need, and so they string together a bunch of verses around that topic. Sometimes they want to use a message to testify of spiritual principles, and they use stories from their lives or the lives of others to get the point across. And these approaches are good and necessary at times, but they often start with the perceived needs of the people, and then they put together a message to meet the needs of the people without always considering maybe what God wants to convey. Where expository preaching, on the other hand, which is what I try to do mostly, aims at starting with what God wants to say and then trying to figure out how that applies to people. And that expository preaching means to expose or explain the author's original intent through grammar and historical context and studying of a passage. 
one of the methods of studying the historical context is to observe texts in their chronological order uh, rather than just reading all over the place. And, and so the thought is that you start at the beginning of the book. You don't just jump in the middle or jump to the end. And there is nothing worse than you know, watching a movie that you're really interested in and then somebody comes halfway through and they start whispering, what's that supposed to mean? What do they mean by that? Why is he so upset? And you feel like saying, if you just get here in the beginning, you would understand. Now, I've mentioned several times that many expositors believe that the book of Hebrews may be a condensation of the content of what Jesus taught the disciples on the road to Emmaus. In Luke 24, 27, Jesus did this, beginning with Moses, that's Genesis, all the way through to the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Christ started with Genesis and then walked his disciples through the whole Old Testament. And this is what we've seen in the book of Hebrews so far, especially the 11th chapter. And if you can just look back at the beginning of the 11th chapter in verse 4, we see that this whole chapter is what we call the hall of faith. It is people from the Old Testament that exhibited faith, starting with the second son of Adam and Eve, Abel, and how he worshipped by faith. Then the author progresses through the book of Genesis, introducing us to other characters like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah. And then he walks through Exodus with Moses all the way through to Deuteronomy. And then last time we were together, we saw the book of Judge Joshua. So today, in Hebrews 11, 32 to 40, our text accelerates through the whole rest of the Old Testament, starting with Judges, with a list of people that I'm just going to call miscellaneous faith. You know, the first ones were key people that you hear about all the time, and now he has a list of miscellaneous faithful people. And this list of people stepped out in faith, and they experienced courage in the midst of deathly situations. They experienced miracles, and they grew in their endurance. And so we're going to learn that faith can operate in the life of anyone whether you're flawed, desperate, or waiting. So let's look at the first group of faithful ones who acted with courage in the faith of death, face of death. We've already read the passage, but verse 32 starts with the phrase, and what more shall I say? This is a favorite phrase of preachers. You use it when you're running out of time <laughs> or material and... Uh, there's a paraphrase called the message, which puts it this way, I could go on and on, but I've run out of time. Well, the author's intent tells us right there, if we're going to expose it, is not to give an exhaustive account of all of these following people. And so I'm not going to do that, but the assumption at the time of the writer was that th these were Jewish Christians who knew the stories of these people, and since we're not Jewish for, for the most part, we, we do need a little bit of a heads up about what he's talking about. The first four examples are from the period of the judges, which was a wild era in Israel's history when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Nobody was following God closely, and God had to smack them to get them back on track. And at the time, Israel was being attacked aggressively by various nations, their neighbors. And so we want to look at the story of Gideon just for a brief moment, and it's found in Judges chapter 6. And I would refer you to your uh, outline, which gives the section. Uh, there's not going to be anything on the wall, so you need to look in your Bibles, Judges chapter 6, as I summarize what's going on. Now, he is significant in the hall of faith because he was fearful and unsure, and yet his faith helped him to win a great victory for Israel. At the time of Gideon, the Midianites had a vast army to the east on the other side of the Jordan River, and every year, for, for years, they would invade the land of Israel on camels and steal all the food that the people ha were harvesting at that time. They'd come in, steal their food, and then ride away in the sunset on their little camels and disappear until next year at the same time. Year after year, 
Consequently, the people of Israel were reduced to living in caves. They were fearful of this mighty army. And so the people finally repented of their doing their own thing, and they prayed to God that he would help them, and thankfully God had had enough. In verse 14 of chapter 6, it says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? So God gave him direct, a direct command to go. But Gideon isn't quite so sure that he's the right man. He's weak in faith, and so he asks for a sign. He famously throws out a fleece on the ground, and he says, Okay, God, if you really want me to do this, then tomorrow morning the, the fleece is going to be uh, 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 dry and the ground is wet. And sure enough, the next morning, that's what it was. But that's not enough for Gideon, so he reverses it and says, now make the fleece dry and the ground be wet. Now, God accommodated him for all these kinds of things, but the principle we need to learn is that Gideon heard God's direct word. He knew what he was supposed to do, but he was looking for more. I need more. I'm not sure. Your word isn't enough. He's sort of like the person who knows that they should apologize to someone because God's word says that, but they go to God and they pray, God, if you really want me to apologize to this person, let them be wearing a red shirt today. You see, when you know something is God's will, you should have the courage to do it and not lay out a fleece. That's not the way to get God's wills. Well, finally, Gideon believes, and then God tests his faith even more. He had 32,000 soldiers in his command, while we learn that the Midianites, according to Judges 8.10, had 135,000 men. He was outnumbered four to one. So you can see why he's a bit nervous. Nevertheless, God wants to decrease his numbers a little bit. And so he tells Gideon... to go and tell anyone who wants to go home that they don't have to stay. And by golly, 22,000 of them went back home. Now to me, this would be the time to throw out a fleece. But before he can do that, God tells him that, well, even 10,000 is too many to go up against the 135,000. And evidently, God's math is a little bit different from the rest of ours. And in Judges chapter 7, verses 4 through 6, God sets up a test to wean the army even more. The men are told to go to the nearby water source and get a drink and watch them. Well, some men went and they knelt down and they scooped the water and lapped it like a dog. Others went down on all fours like they were doing push-ups and drank deeply from the water. And after they drank, God told Gideon to tell them that all those who lapped like a dog stepped to the left. You're my new soldiers. I mean, he might as well have just gone doggy, doggy, step right. Right? I mean, that, what a way to pick an army. We don't know exactly why God did it this way. We're not told, and so we have to be careful. But a speculation is this. In Judges 7, 1, they were camped uh, by the river Herod, which separated them from the Midianites. In other words, the Midianites were on the other side, so that every time someone wanted a drink, they had to be careful because there were snipers picking them off. And so those who just went down on all fours were vulnerable. They weren't paying attention, and they were disqualified. At any rate, God chose an army of 300 to go against 135,000. That's outnumbered 450 to 1. Gideon had courage even at this point, and he, he organized them into three groups and had them surround the gigantic Midian army, and they were equipped with only torches hidden in a jar, their voices, and trumpets. And at the appointed hour, the men began to shout. They blew their trumpets, and they broke the pitchers so that the light flooded the area in the total darkness, and the Midianites were so confused they didn't know how big the army was, and it looked like they were surrounded by 
thousands and thousands. And so they started fighting with themselves, and many of them were killed, and they were routed and ran in confusion. And this led to a great victory for Gideon, whose men took a step of faith in the face of death and overwhelming odds. And so we learned this principle. When we respond in faith, we accomplish things that only God could do. There's no way humanly he could have done this. But by trusting, they did what only God can do. Well, our next judge in our Hebrews text is Barak. Whenever you mention Barak's name, you associate another name with it, and it is the name Deborah. Deborah is a hero in her own right, although she's not mentioned in Hebrews, because the attention is upon Barak and his half-faith, and that's what's trying to be uh, illustrated. As a prophetess, Deborah told Barak that the Lord God had commanded him to go and take 10,000 men and that he, and, and lead the way to Mount Tabor, and I will lure Sisera to you and and take him to the Kishon River and I will give him into your hands. Well, Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you don't, I won't. And so she had to say to him that if if I go with you, you're going to have the victory, but you're not going to get the credit. A woman is going to get the credit. Now, none of the men of Israel at this time, including Barak, would step up and take charge. That's how decrepit the nation was at that point. God promised to use him, but because of his hesitation, he wouldn't get the credit. And the fact of a woman stepping up to take the lead was was not the bad thing. What was bad was that there were no men willing to lead and that the women had to do it. Barak was, Barak was hesitant because the Canaanites had iron chariots, we're told. They had, in the vernacular, an, tanks. They had tanks, and Israel had nothing. His lack of faith in the simple word of the Lord and insisting on Deborah's presence was a weakness in his faith, but he had faith in the end, but it was not a full faith. Do you understand that? By the way, most of our steps of faith are not done with full faith. We only have a little bit of faith at times. Maybe you're not sure whether you should volunteer for a certain ministry. You don't feel equipped for it. You're afraid of failure, and so you don't want to take a step, but you sense God is leading you nevertheless, so you take that step, even though you're ready to jump ship if things get rough. I felt that way many years ago when I agreed to pastor this church. I still feel that way at times. But you know, faith is a journey in which we put one foot in front of the other, not knowing exactly where it's going to land. And joy is in the journey, not in knowing where you're going. Joy is in the journey. So once Barak acted in faith, God sent a storm and he flooded the Kishon River and the iron chariots were trapped in the mud and they won a great victory. Meanwhile, the leader of the enemy, Sisera, got away and he took refuge in a tent of a woman named Jair, whose people were allies to Sisera. And that's all found in Judges chapter 4, by the way, and you'll want to read this for yourself later because it's one of the most... Uh, interesting stories in the Old Testament. In verse 19, it says, he came to her tent and asks her for a drink. And so she brings him a blanket and, a, and some goat's milk. She brought him his binky and a bubba. <laughs> and being tired, he wants to sleep, and so he asks her to guard the tent door, and she says she will. Well, while he was sound asleep, because warm milk makes you sleepy, you see, Jael grabbed a tent peg, not a Walmart tent peg, but a North Face tent peg. And I love this, verse 21. She went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and right into the ground, and he died. You think? You think? 
She nailed him. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Don't say I never mention it. The battle was co-led by a woman, and a woman killed the ultimate enemy. Barak was slow to face, and if he was a little stronger, he would have got the credit, but all of them together took steps of faith, and that's all you need to remember for this point of the message. Most of us are familiar with the next character, Samson. He was another judge when the Philistines were plaguing Israel. He had good looks and great strengths and the blessings of God. He was a Nazarite, not to be confused with a Nazarene. A Nazarite was one who was under a vow uh, to be separated unto God, and his vow was to stay away from certain foods and strong drink, and he was never to cut his hair, and that, and that would be God's strength behind him. Samson performed many various feats of war. He slew a 1,000 people with nothing but the jawbone of an ass. He caught 300 foxes and tied their tails together and then lit them on fire and let them go, and they burned all the fields of the Philistines. But it's almost impossible to think of Samson without thinking about Delilah. Uh, that's why I have two dogs named Samson and Delilah. He not only had a weakness with women, he had a weakness with his emotions altogether, and if we had the time to talk about him more, we would find that he was the weakest of all strong men. His trust in Delilah led to his hair getting cut, and he was captivated, and his eyes punched out, and he became a prisoner. And yet in the end, he renewed his faith in the Lord and was able to conquer more in his death than in his life. And Samson is a sad testament that you know, you can exercise faith and be an inconsistent believer. And God can still use an inconsistent person. He knew his strength came from God. He believed the angel's prophecies, and he believed that God was using his gift of strength. But the key to all of these weak men is that this was a dark period in Israel's history in which everyone was wanting. And yet God had made a promise to the forefathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would protect this nation at certain times. And God had to keep his promise. And sometimes he has to use broken vessels to do it. Well, what more can I say? Jephthah is next, and time doesn't permit us to say too much about him. He was the son of a prostitute, had a bad start. He, he lived during the time of the Ammonites when they were persecuting Israel. And he was a successful warrior, so the Israelites asked him to be their new general. And as the new leader, he sent word trying to negotiate with the Ammonites in chapter 11 and verses 12. So we're in chapter 11 of Judges now but to no avail, and so when they refused to cooperate, he got an army together, and God told him he would be with him, and in the heat of his zeal, he made a vow before the Lord that the Lord could take whatever came out of his house when he returned in victory, and it would be God's. He made a vow, chapter 11, verses 30 and 31. And as you may know, his own daughter was the first one who came out the door. And many theologians believe that he sacrificed her as a fulfillment of his vow. And that may be, but I believe there's another possibility. There is a translation problem here that doesn't make that sacrifice necessary. The Hebrew word wa, or the, or the modern vav, is the word and, or, or can be translated both ways. And I believe the or is the preferred rendering. So it would read like this. Whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's or I will offer it up as a burnt offering. And so there are two categories of vows listed in Leviticus 27. What do you do if you are vowing a person versus vowing an animal? And I think that all he is doing is he is pledging her to be a perpetual virgin for the rest of her life. And this was the beginning of what we know as nuns. Not that he killed her. Nevertheless, don't get stuck on this issue and don't think about every, anything else right now. All you need to know is that Jephthah, had such faith that he was willing to give his most precious thing if God would just use him. 
That's how much he wanted to be used. Well, next we see David. We all know David. And, of course, the prime example of faith in the incident, the episode that floats to the top, is his conflict with Goliath. Goliath was plaguing Israel, and he was a giant. And we know from our text in 1 Samuel 17 that he was 9 feet 9 inches tall. He had full armor on, and, and the weight of it was over 125 pounds. He had a spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. I mean, that's like throwing a bowling ball. That, that, was, that was Goliath. Meanwhile, David, and I like to think of him about 5'5", five, five, 125 pounds when he's soaking wet, in the olden days. He had no armor. All he had was faith. He believed because he was taught from childhood by his parents that nobody has the right to taunt the living God. And with five smooth stones, he boldly approached the giant, and by faith he slung a single stone, and it struck him in the forehead so that he fell forward on his face. And I'm convinced the last thought that Goliath had was, Nothing like this ever entered my head before. (laughs) What more can I say? We go to Samuel. And with Samuel, there's not enough time, but for the rest of the Old Testament, the books of 1 and 2 Samuel and the prophets, it mentions the prophets come to mind. You see, to be a prophet in those days, you had to go against the kings, and you were taking your life in your hands when you did. And so, this is faith. They risk their lives to speak the truth. Operating by faith doesn't mean there isn't doubt at times. It's just that you rely on God more than you rely on your doubts. Even in the New Testament, we find one of the disciples praying, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So, we're all in that boat. A summary of verse 32 is this. God used flawed people, and he honors their courage when they face death and trust him in faith. Well, the next set of faith witnesses found in verses 33 through 35 demonstrate how faith produces victory in miraculous ways. Who through faith conquered kingdoms and enforced justness. You see, the men and women of the Old Testament in this list furthered the cause of God. They enforced justice. They were used to bring God's justice, not social justice, God's justice to the world in a time when there were no righteous governments to defend justice. That's what judges is all about. These nations were just going around swallowing up people and increasing their power, and God used little Israel to push them back and to put them in their place. Daniel stopped the mouths of lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego quenched the power of fire. Many others escaped the edge of the sword miraculously, and, and they became kings and became mighty in war. Verse 35 adds, women received back their dead. That's talking about when Elijah raised the young boy. And then later on, Elisha did the same thing by faith. People, God doesn't need our strength. He provides it when we trust. When we respond in faith, we accomplish things that only God can do. And so a true faith walk reveals that God's power is at work in our lives. And you can accomplish anything if you trust in his strength and not your own. Have you had that experience? Have you agreed to do something that you were convinced you could not do? Have you grown in some area where you knew you had no natural ability, but God used you mightily anyway? That's a sign that faith is alive in you. At other times, however, we need to admit, faith doesn't always result in a miracle. Sometimes we go through faith tests to increase our endurance. True faith 
keeps going even when, you, when nothing miraculous happens. Verse 35b, some were tortured, refusing to accept release. The Greek word for tortured is tumpanizo. It's where timpani comes from. And, and it's used to speak of beating on a drum. And the torture was such that a person was stretched over something so that their muscles could not be used to react against a blow coming to them so that they felt the full force of the beating. There were people so faithful that they were willing to accept pain rather than deny their Lord. Some of them didn't accept release when it was given to them. And this is talking about our ancient forefathers, but even in modern times, John Bunyan was told he was put in prison because of his preaching, and he was told that he could be released if he would stop preaching. And this is what he said. If you release me today, I will preach tomorrow. And because of that, he spent the next 12 years in prison where he wrote the Pilgrim's Progress, which has been the better for us in the long run. Others suffered mockings and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. Some of history's greatest Christians are in prison right now. Some were stoned. Stoning was a common way to kill somebody. Tradition says that Isaiah was sawn in two. Men were put to death by the sword. And by the way, these things are still happening today. Statistics tell us there are more Christians persecuted today than throughout all of church history. And somehow, you know, we've bought into the lie that being a Christian means living happily everly afterly. We think it means having all our needs met and living prosperously. We think everyone would love us if we were just more winsome. It's because we say things badly that we get in trouble. But if we were just smarter... They would love us. Well, this passage alone should put that to death. True, faithful believers, more often than not, find themselves ostracized, walking around in skins of sheep and goats and destitute and afflicted and mistreated, where we have to admit admit the closest we come to goatskin is cashmere. Indeed, the world was not worthy of them. Their suffering was a gift from God to the world. The world thought they were useless and wanted to get rid of them. But I want to tell you, these saints did not suffer because of a lack of faith, but because they had faith. You understand that? They were just as pleasing to God as the ones who experienced a miracle. Sometimes God is honored by miraculously delivering you from persecution or illness. However, Warren Wearsby hits it on the nose when he says, it takes more faith to endure than it does to escape. And God is glorified with our endurance. And faith means you step out with no guarantee of what is going to happen. And so, verse 39, all these people that we've been talking about, though command commended through their faith, they didn't receive what was promised since God provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. All that saying is they didn't receive the full understanding of who Christ was, but we are the fulfillment of their faith. We made them mature. We're all in this together. They demonstrated to us that faith can operate in the life of anyone, whether flawed desperate or waiting and we need to ask which one are you approval was given not because of their personal integrity but because of faith and so the promise referred to here goes back to the beginning of hebrews the promised land the, the seed of abraham was promised this land in Israel, that they would flourish there if they walked by faith. And if they walked by faith, God's righteousness would rise to the surface. And they never saw it happen. They never saw the promise of the Messiah, but they still walked by faith. Theologically, all of the stories of faith in Israel's history are there to teach God's people, that's both Israel and the church, 
that if we would only follow him in faithfulness, God's perfect righteousness would rise to the surface. The biblical record shows that one little person like David, who had faith by himself, was able to throw off a whole nation. And the lesson is to Israel, if you would all have just had faith at the same time, you wouldn't have had any enemies. They would have turned to me. God plus one is the victory. And that's still true today. You know, in pockets of the world, God's people are standing and shining and drawing others to Christ. And I believe in every church where Christ's name is preached, there are a few, at least, who are living faithful lives. But could you imagine if we all lived faithfully at the same time, what a difference our church would be? What a light there would be for the world. It might result in more persecution, but you wouldn't mind it. We are the ones who received something better, and the better is the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we can look back at what they were looking forward to, and Jesus Christ came to absorb the punishment of our sin that we all deserve. And so... I have two large applications. One, if you do not know Christ, and it is this, have you trusted in him for your salvation from your sins? That's the first step of faith that anybody needs to take. You have to understand that Jesus Christ is God's son who was sent here in the flesh to take your place upon the cross for the sins that you deserve. And until you admit that you are a sinner, you can't get saved from anything. But you need to admit that and that God mercifully paid your price. Will you trust him? That's where you start. That's how you become a believer. And so what have we as those who are already believers learned from this passage? Well, we learn that God wants us to begin our walk with him through faith. But he also wants us to continue our walk with him by faith. And faith will produce courage in the midst of the face of death. It will produce miracles at times, and it will build your endurance. And so the author's point is that the Old Testament saints were faithful through all of these trials. And if they were faithful, not having the fulfillment of the promises, how much more should this little church in Hebrews be faithful, be able to look back and see the promise fulfilled in Christ? Or how much more should we be faithful knowing all that we know? They didn't know all the stuff that we know. So how do we apply all that we've learned through this hall of faith of faithful people? I hate to tell you, but I can't get into it till chapter 12 and 13. That's what that's about. All of this is just preparation. Now, what do you do with it? And since we can't wait till next week, I want to just give you something to take away. I want to say this. I think we as Christians in the United States have been insulated from a lot of these things. And I believe we are going to experience some of the persecutions in these verses. We pray for our missionaries who are going through these things right now, but I think it's soon coming that we're going to be praying for ourselves going through these things. Our culture is becoming more intolerant of Christian beliefs. Already, some of you, I I hear, are experiencing increased mockings and ridicule. You're experiencing a loss of participation in certain events because of your beliefs. Soon businesses may be limited and not be able to be licensed based on whether they buy the party line of culture's thinking. It's already happening, have you not heard, in the Catholic Church this week. They can't even adopt, be involved in adoption because they will not give over to the uh, LGBTQ whatever. We're going to have to stand against certain things in our culture because they're just unjust and unbiblical. Are you ready? Who's going to stand against the world? Is there another Abraham and Sarah amongst us? Is there a giant slayer here? Are you willing to give up what you can't keep anyway for the sake of the cross? Why should we stand up in this mixed up world? Is it because we think, well, if we just do, we're going to change the world? Nah, that may not happen. Oh, we pray for a revival again. I do. 
Yet we must stand upon God's word because that's what the faithful have always done and that's what we're supposed to do whether it changes anything or not. Oftentimes, it brings us pain and suffering but we're still called to stand, period. In my reading this week, I was reminded of the famous story of Telemachus retold in Chuck Colson's book, Loving God. It's a story about an Asiatic monk who lived in A.D. 400. And historian Theodoret, who wrote during that time, wrote of him in his ecclesiastical history, crediting him for the end of the gladiatorial games in ancient Rome. And so Colson elaborates a little bit. You have to take that into consideration. But he says this. One day, Telemachus felt that the Lord wanted him to go to Rome. He didn't know why. He'd been living as a hermit and been away from everything. But he felt a call to go to Rome. And so he went, and there was a festival going on because the Romans had just experienced victory over the Goths. And in the midst of their commotion, the monk was looking for a reason why he was there. And he said, perhaps... It's not sheer coincidence that I've arrived at this festival time. Perhaps God has a role for me to play. And not knowing it, he was ushered into the Colosseum, although we're not sure it was the Colosseum or just another uh, arena. But there was a gladiator contest going on. And he could hear the cries of the animals underneath the ground. And the gladiators marched out into the arena and they saluted the emperor that we who are about to die salute thee. He shuddered. He'd never heard of such a thing. He'd never seen such a thing. And the fighting began, of course. And no one paid attention to him yelling in the stand, stop it, stop it. And so he padded down the stairs and into the arena itself. And he was going up against this, he, he was this little man with, with a monk's habit on against these gigantic athletes. And he cried to them, please, in the name of Christ, stop it. And the crowd laughed, thinking he was part of the circus. But then his, his movement blocked the view of one of the gladiators who almost got killed. And so the crowd started yelling, run him through, kill him, get rid of him. And the gladiator knocked him down with his shield, which would have been a merciful thing if he had gotten up and left. But he got up again and he kept at it. Until finally one of them slashed him with the sword. And this is where Theodora needs to come in. The crowd picked up stones and stoned him. Now we do know for a fact that Emperor Honorarius was so moved by the martyrdom of this man that he ended the gladiatorial games. But the following was added to the story uh, through the Fox's Book of Martyrs. And Ronald Reagan repeated this part in 1984. He said, a hush fell over the arena all eyes were focused on the still form in the crimson sand. The gladiators put down their swords, and one by one, the spectators left their seats and emptied the Colosseum. Telemachus was a man of faith. He saw a wrong, and he couldn't live with it, but he died for his faith. But God used it mightily. Living by faith, in this case, meant dying by faith. And he did ultimately change things, though he himself died. Are you sensing that God is asking you to do something beyond your abilities? Is there a fearful situation that you don't think you're equipped for? Do you feel like only a miracle can get you out of the pit that you're in? That's when faith does its best work. That's when it's most obvious. Don't despair. I pray that God will challenge each of you to take personal steps of faith more and more this year. Not just one, but a consistent set of steps. I mean, this building project was a step of faith for us. We didn't know what was going to happen, and we still don't, to be honest with you. But this is nothing compared to what I pray for. I pray that God would raise up not just one or two Davids, but a host of us who would trust him for spiritual goals 
And I pray that we as a group could be a kingdom of priests to a hurting world, even if it rains down persecution. We're going to learn next week that the secret is to turn our eyes upon Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, because there is victory in faith. There is victory in Jesus as we learn to look at him. Let's pray. Our Father, we, uh, we thank you for the examples of this hall of faith, people that were flawed with half faith, and yet they experienced miracles and definitely endurance, and they held to the end. We pray that you will keep us strong as we await the day of your return, and if you give us pockets of uh, rejoicing that things go the way you want, we praise you. And if we suffer for it, we praise you as well. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we close by singing Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story.
and bought me with his redeeming blood, my healer and my victory. Be all glory, majesty, and power both for now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace.